Today's featured car is one of my all-time favorites, 1959 Rambler Cross Country Wagon. But before we talk about it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. With every featured car, we dive in deep. We give you specs and perceptions that other car channels simply don't. This channel is more than walking around a car with music. Anyway, if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, hit the subscribe button, turn on the bell icon next to it to never miss a video because we drop between four and five videos a week. Also, if you'd like to get in touch with me, two ways are the best ways. You could either leave a comment in the comment section below. I read every single comment that I get. I'm a very personable person and it will always be like that. It will always be me. It will never be a secretary or a computer. And I say that because a lot of channels, it's like talking to a wall. You're not talking to a wall on this channel. You're talking to me. Anyway, that's one way. The other way is we recently made a Facebook group that correlates with this channel. The best thing about the group is it gives you the opportunity to share your rides, your stories, experiences, memories, there's no obligation to join the Facebook group. I'm just showing you that it's a thing. And if you want to engage with other people on this channel, it gives you the opportunity to do that. And it also gives you the opportunity to see previews of featured cars on there, as well as I take some of the spec sheets and I put them on there as well as ads. And sometimes I'm, I'm adding a new feature. If I find a car in the area that's like a bargain price, I will share it on there because I can't afford a car right now, but that doesn't mean that I should you know, not give away the location of some really cool cars. Like I just found a, um, I think it was a 65 Avani. They're asking 6,500 bucks for it. It's a barn find, but stuff like that. So it's there at your disposal. If you want it, the link is in the description. Also, if you totally dig the content, be sure to give us a like so more people can see this video in the future. Also share it with any of your car friends on different social medias so we could grow this channel into being, I'm hoping that this channel will one day be one of the go-to classic car channels. Let's talk 1959 AMC. AMC was short for American Motors Corporation, which was formed in 1954 when Nash Motors and Hudson Motors merged. AMC was looked upon as a, I'm using air quotes, you can't see me, economy car. It's also important to point out that every single product made by American Motors was a unibody construction during this time period. Actually, Nash pioneered that. Nash is one of the very early adopters in the American market to pioneer the unibody idea. For those that don't know, unibody construction means that the body and frame are all one piece. Whereas body on frame construction is literally a body, the body of the car is bolted to the frame and the frame has like the wheels and the, the suspension and all the other components to make the car move. The body is just the part in which you sit in like the cabin and stuff and the unit body, it's all of that is combined into one. 1959 AMC model lineup consisted of three different car lines, the Metropolitan, American series, which was offered in a car and a two-door wagon. And then they offered the Rambler, which was offered in a car as well as a wagon. Here's where things get a little bit confusing. They offered this wagon as a junior size and a senior size, for a lack of a better term. The junior size was called the Rambler 6 and V8. The V8 was known as the Rebel. And they also offered three different trim levels, which we're going to get to here real quick. I just want to talk about the Senior Series, which was the Ambassador. And they offered that in a pillared station wagon form, as well as a hardtop. And the hardtop is the holy grail for people that like these wagons, because they didn't make that many of them, and they were really rust prone. And a lot of times, the water would just get into areas in the car, and it would just rust apart, like... I've heard horror stories where they actually rust in half. I've never saw a 1959 Rambler Ambassador Cross Country hardtop wagon in my lifetime. They didn't make that many of them. They're super rare. And they all, all the Ambassadors have the 327 V8, which was a very potent engine at the time. Super underrated engine. But we're not going to get into that today because our car is the 6. 
Real quick before we move on, the Ambassador version is about six inches longer than the regular cross country version, but they didn't add the six inches to the cab. They added it to the front fenders, so the front the front clip is longer than the rest of it. Moving on to trim levels, they offered three trim levels. The Deluxe was like the Chevy 150 of the bunch. There is no trim on it. It's bottom of the barrel. The Super, that is what our car is. It's really nice. It's middle of the road. It's got nice trim. The Custom is at the top of the heap. And the, the biggest difference is in the Custom, it has the vent windows in the back. Moving on to some specs, 193.61 inches long, 72.2 inches wide, 58.57 inches tall, 108 inches was the wheelbase. They claimed with the six cylinder, with the three speed manual, with optional overdrive, I know that's a lot of stuff that you have to get to get this, but they claim 32 miles per gallon. If you have one of these, what did you guys get in the comment section below? The owner said that he's getting high 20s, but his is an automatic. Zero to 60, 16 seconds. Price, $2,562, which would be equivalent to you spending $25,734.10 in the year 2022. Moving on to some engine specs, 195.6 cubic inch displacement, inline six, 3.2 liters, making 127 brake horsepower at 4,200 RPMs with a bore of 3.1 inches and a stroke of 4.3 inches. Compression was 8.7 to one, featured four main bearings in a cast iron block slash crankcase, as well as the heads were also made out of cast iron. This engine had solid lifters, and it's also important to point out that this engine started off life as a flathead engine, and AMC was actually a very conservative company in the sense that they didn't really have a whole lot of money, and instead of designing a whole different engine, they just designed a whole different head to put on their existing engine. And then they ran this engine for another at least 10 years into the future. They built this engine forever. This engine was bulletproof. Moving to the optional engine, 250 cubic inch displacement Rebel V8, 4.1 liters. Not to get confused with the Rambler Rebel that came in 1957. That is a totally different animal that hopefully one day soon we can feature on the channel because a lot of people don't even know that that car exists. Anyway, this engine makes 215 horsepower at 4,200 RPM with a bore of 3.50 inches and a stroke of 3.25 inches. It featured a forged crankshaft and rods, aluminum pistons, cast iron block, hydraulic lifters. They were new for 1959. Compression for this engine was 8.7 to 1, and it was fed with a four-barrel carburetor. Three transmissions on offer for 1959. The three-speed manual, which was a column shift manual, three-speed manual with optional electric overdrive, or the Flash-O-Matic, which was a three-speed automatic that was activated using push buttons to the left of the steering wheel column. Let's talk options, not getting into all of the options, but the major options were Weather Eye. That was AMC's air conditioning unit, air suspension, which was available on all V8 models, or the exterior mounted spare tire. I wanna show you these door handles, they're really cool. You can put your hands up inside here and push up like that. So the door panel is very basic looking. You got an armrest door handle. This is the door handle to get out. And this is the window crank, but look how cool this is. So this was their other claim to fame. That's two and a half cranks. It goes up really fast. These are the vent windows. Just look at how big those are. This was considered an economy car back in the day. Coming down here to the pedal box. Right before we get to the pedal box, here's the door tab. It says it's a double safe single unit body. So it's body and frame is constructed as one piece. Just notice, I'm gonna back up here. Notice how wide that door swings open. It's almost 90 degrees. So it allows you plenty of access to get inside. 
Coming back down here to the pedal box, emergency brake is here. If you had a clutch, it would be here. Brake pedal, gas pedal, high beam switch here on the floor, brake release. This is the park. Right next to it is the light for the handbrake. That other light is for the four ways. This might be for the windshield wash washer. That's what that looks like. Coming back to these seats, just check these seats out. They're not the original seats. The original seats were shot and the owner actually found these seats and they fit in here perfectly. So he reupholstered them in the same kind of upholstery that would have been with the car it's in the same style. All right, I just want to show you a couple of these lines. So notice this line, it starts right here and it ends kind of in the center of the front fender. Also notice the front fender flares. It also flares at the bottom of the rocker panels and it goes all the way back to the rear wheel wells and it's still flared. Coming back to the very rear, there is a lot going on with this rear end. There's a line at the bottom there also notice how the flare goes away. It tapers back into the body. There's a line that comes out for the bumper. My favorite line on this whole car starts right here. And it, it's almost like a half circle. And it goes all the way back to the end. And it gets bigger and bigger and it protrudes more outward. And just check out this design. I love the way that this looks right here. Those, these are backup lights. And that's where the turn signal would be. Absolutely love this fin design. It doesn't get enough praise because it's curved outwards as well as inwards. It's almost like the shape of a boomerang if you look at it from behind. But it also curves inward. So there's a lot going on with this rear end design. On to the button switches and knobs. All the way to the left is the push buttons for the automatic transmission. Five buttons. I'm assuming it's in neutral right now. The park lever button is right below it, which we've already covered. Right next to it's reverse, and then the bottom two, D2, D1, and low. Moving to the right, the top is for the wipers. Right below it's for the lights. Then there's two levers that almost looks like one single lever, but it's actually two. One of them controls the vent, the other one controls the heater. Two more controls, the one on top controls the defroster and the one on the bottom controls the fan speed. Moving to the gauge cluster, just check this out. So the left hand turn signals all the way up there to the left hand corner, the right hand turn signal indicators up, up and to the right hand side. It goes, the speedometer goes up to 120. There's an oil light. The fuel gauge is down at the left hand corner. The odometer in the center temperature gauge is off to the bottom right hand corner. Here's your ignition switch. This is one ashtray and then there's another ashtray right here. The glove box is right there. Two cigarette lighters in this car. One is located right to the right of the speedometer. The other one is located to the left of the clock. Speaking of clock, just check out this clock. I absolutely love it. And the fact that it works is even cooler. This is the over the hood impression of this car. It looks incredible. This is how much space, actually before we get into that, this is what first person would look like if one was driving it. And then this is how much space I have underneath the steering wheel. There is a lot of space under the steering wheel because in part, this steering wheel isn't absolutely gigantic like a lot of steering wheels. This is like, this is pretty decent sized steering wheel, but in the same respect, it's not 20 inches tall like in a Chevy Impala or something like that. Lots of headroom in this car. Lots of space in this car. It's got seats in the back and chairs and nice dome light up top. It's got the sun visors and they're nicely, nicely padded. Just notice the wraparound windshield and how far the A-pillars sit back. 
All right, coming to the rear door. So just check out the design of this rear door. The Customs had these vent windows in the back. This is a Super, it doesn't have that. Armrest or door handle. This is the door handle to get out and you'd pull it up like this. This is the window crank for the big window and two cranks and it's all the way down and it goes all the way down. But notice how this is. This is really cool that it's, it's not completely straight. It's more higher here than it is back here. Ashtray here. And it's like that on the other side. So this car has four ashtrays in it. Here's the rear seat. I'm in the back seat. I got adequate headroom. There's, there's actually, it's actually very comfortable in here despite it not having that much seat room in the back. The seats are slightly reclined. So you see the seat profile there, it's not at 90 degrees. I don't know what angle that would be per se, but it's not 90 degrees, but it's, it's really nice in here. There's lots of headroom. It doesn't feel claustrophobic. This is what the view looks like from the back seat of the front seat and the dashboard. Coat hooks on both sides. There's one here and there's one over there. There's no lights back here, just the dome light here in the center. But the greenhouse is really nice. I really like this line here. And you can see the fins from inside here, which is super cool. The other really cool thing about Ramblers is all, every car, well, in the Rambler line, I don't know if the Americans do this. In the comment section below, I don't think the Metropolitans do it. I don't think it's big enough in the Metro. But it's also worth mentioning that you don't have to put both sides of the seat down. You could just put down one side of the seat. And the articles claim that one it has two twin size beds. So one queen size bed. You could literally go camping in this car. And it was made for like the traveling salesperson. So if you're going across country, that's where the name came from. Selling stuff. You could sleep in your car comfortably and not get a hotel room. This car and concept was way ahead of its time because if they offered a feature like this now, they would sell like hotcakes. I believe Nash is the first one to offer or pioneer the fold down seat options. If I'm wrong in the comment section below, please. All right, coming to the rear back here, it's lockable, but if you wanna to get to the back access, put this window down. And just notice how it's all chromed out here. Getting in the rear. The handle right here. Just pull it. This tailgate has a lot of heft to it. It's not the heaviest tailgate that I've ever operated, but it feels like a quality piece. Also, look at how these hinges operate. And did you see the safety wire? It looks like safety wire coming out of the bottom of the load floor area. He's got a lot of uh, rims slash hubcaps. These are buttons. The, the mats button to the, to the thing. The spare tire is right in here, right underneath this floor. Right, coming up to the under the hood section. There's the levers right here behind the L, and you just push it up like this. I just want to show you these. This gives it the appearance that these letters are floating when the hood is shut, and they're just connected right behind here. Notice the screen to catch all the bugs from going into the radiator.
Real quick, just look at this fin design one more time. Notice it curves out as well as it curves in. It's a very awesome design, very underrated design of the 50s. If you look at a 57 Chevy fin, it's very basic. This has a lot going on with it. On to the pros and cons. I made this list of pros and cons. On the pro side, great fuel economy with the 6 and also with the 250 V8 considering it's a V8, it still gets around 17 miles to the gallon, some sources said. Push button automatic, excellent visibility slash driving position, basic dashboard, lots of room, the back seats are comfortable and would make a great long haul car. Seats turn into a bed feature, roll down, rear window, timeless design. This, in my opinion, is the best wagon AMC ever made, and a lot... A lot of people can say like the 58 is essentially the same body style, but they don't have the same paint scheme. They look kind of weird. The fins are pretty much the same, but this to me is the best design that they ever came up with. And the engines are bulletproof. The owner of this car had the engine pulled out one time in the 70s, and he's driven it all over the country since then. On the con side, these are extremely rust prone. If you're looking for one of these, be sure to look at the underside and make sure that they're not rotted out. Some trim parts are really hard to find. Question, I, I waited until almost the end of the episode to ask this question, but I've heard conflicting information where they made a hardtop version of the Rambler cross country wagon. I always thought that you had to step up to the Ambassador cross country wagon if you wanted the hardtop, and I couldn't find any pictures. That's why I'm asking the question here now. Did they make a hardtop version of the Rambler cross country? In the comment section below, please. One more thing, if you totally dig the content, please give us a like so more people can see this video in the future. Anyway, until next time, toodaloo!